the Wednesday Week, the Sheffield Wednesday Fan Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Wednesday Week, lovingly brought to you by our friends, colleagues and occasional lovers at the Riverside Cafe. Um, I'm James. You can call me Podcast Man, I don't mind. On Team TWW this week, um, Dan Fudge, do you have craft beer in hand right now? Uh, retro shirt, craft beer, and uh, I've got my Hertha Berlin scarf on as well. So, yeah, I think I've, I'm, I think I've, I've got the trifecta up there, yes. You're ticking the boxes, that's good. <laughs> um, Rich Davies, um, have you had a Marco Matthias tart today? I haven't had a release tarts today. No, no, unfortunately. No, I've... Ah, uh, uh, right, right. No, as, as good as I've got is some Costa yep. porridge today. That's as uh, as good as I've had. No, well, that's it then. You're uh, you're out of the uh, okay. gang, I'm afraid. Oh, sorry about sorry. that. Okay. Um, Ed, Eddie Hoyland, have you written a dog shit column for the star today? Or not? <laughs> not, not only have I done that, but I, um, I'm, I'm currently in Bochum, um, and I'm broadcasting whilst eating uh, a dozen custard Portuguese custard tarts and drinking a 6.8742% ABV craft ale. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what, James. James, I've got to congratulate you on that. That was a great intro. Well played. I enjoyed that. That was. I didn't know you could do that. That's made me laugh, that. <laughs> Good stuff. Right, okay, let's... Um... Let's talk some football then, and let's talk. Uh, let's talk Stoke. And uh, first game back after the international break, which seemed to last forever this time. It was a long, long old break. Um, and well, Eddie, I mean, a couple of surprises. Um, we kind of knew that Forestieri was was close to being back. We knew that Hooper was kind of back in training, played a couple of um, sort of practice games. Uh, but Hooper straight back into the starting lineup. Were, were were you a bit taken aback by that? Yeah, I was, and I think it's something that a lot of the Wednesday fans in the week leading up to the game, when it became apparent that you know we kind of had the chance of quite a few of these players vying for that position. I think the the calmer heads suggested that yeah, you know maybe Forestieri would start because it's a bit more of a versatile move away from home. Um, but I would have put my life on it being a, you know, a, a new year up there, you know, something that you could um, you could expect. And maybe after an hour or second half, if the game wasn't going the way that we wanted, then you introduce Gary Hooper. Um, and instead, Steve Bruce did it the exact opposite way. He started with Hooper and Forestieri in a fairly uh, traditional 4-4-2. So, yeah, it was um, it was certainly a shock. but. Having said that, it's been a long road back for Gary Hooper, and he he probably, in all fairness, has more match fitness than you might expect, given the fact that he's been kind of nursed back to health. He's played plenty, um, you know, whether it's under 23s or behind closed doors, et cetera, et cetera. So clearly, Steve Bruce felt that he was he was able to at least start the game, and you know, he he made it more than an hour. I don't think, other than the fact that obviously there was no goals there. Um, I don't think you can fault the performance, and I don't think that you can fault the decision to put him on there. I don't think we we missed something by him being in there from the start. And I would argue that bringing him on as an impact sub probably probably would have stressed his body a little bit too much, and he needed to play himself into a match. So I could understand why Steve Bruce did it, and it kind of made sense. Give us a bit more of a critique on his performance then, because you said you thought he did all right. Um, what What kind of... What did you make of that that kind of first game back for for Hoops? He's he's obviously still missing. I say he's missing a yard of pace. He's been out for so long. We don't know what his level of pace is. We don't know what his level of fitness is going to be like. He clearly still has everything that made Gary Hooper such an integral part of that. You know the the, the strong start to the season that we had um, under Jos Lukai before his initial injury. So I think the jury is still out, but I think he showed enough. You know, obviously early on, um, it was his ball um, that played in for, who was it that we had a, a, a shot that was, um, it was in the back of the net, but given offside, was it Boyd? Um, you know, so yeah. Hooper created, he did what Gary Hooper has done for us uh, over the years in the sense that, you know, he's not 
He's not there to be a target man. He's there to bring other players into play um, and be a kind of all-round attacking force in there. So especially given that he probably was lacking a bit of fitness, I, yeah, I think his, his performance was exactly what you would expect for a guy who hasn't played any meaningful football in the best part of 18 months. Um, Fudge, many is the time that we've reminisced about um, the performances we saw of Gary Hooper back in his kind of very early stages of his um, Sheffield Wednesday career. And I think we're probably thinking back to the defeat down at Charlton, particularly when we mm -hmm. uh, kind of talk about that stage of his career. Um, I thought on Saturday that there were just shades of that early Gary Hooper. You know, when... when we, in hindsight, we realised he wasn't match fit for those first few games that he played for us. And he just looked a bit sluggish, yard off the pace, almost to the point where you could think, hey, is he a bit lazy, this guy? Um, that's kind of what, what I kind of saw in him on um, on on Saturday. A question for you, and I guess for everyone, really, um, to pitch in and, and, and tell us what they think. Um, we've kind of assumed that Hooper, as a, a relative high earner, someone that's had problems with injuries, that, that there's little, if any, chance that his contract will get renewed at the end of the season. Um, but he's back playing now. He's got seven games of this season left. It, is, is there a chance of him getting a new deal? Well, you see, I, I, got, I, I don't know, because there is, there's, what, seven games left now of the season. And, uh, and, and, and like you said, Eddie, it, it's shock. It actually was shocking in the actual true sense of the word that he was not in negative connotation. I was actually shocked that he went straight into the, uh, into the first team. But we know, like, like you were saying, James, we, 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 we know that Hooper can play, uh, can play very well. We know he's lethal. We know he's naturally gifted as a footballer. And we, we've always spoken about his, uh, his movement off the ball, the way he pulls defenders out and uh, and actually creates opportunities for other people as well. And yeah, we are probably getting a um, getting a, a, a version of Gary Hooper from the 3-0 drubbing at Charlton when we had uh, somebody chanting Gary Hooper's dad, which for some reason has stuck with me for the past <laughs> three years he's been with us. But um, but I think two same, years is a... Same. <laughs> I still sing it now. Um, I think two years is a... Um, is is a long time to really actually play competitive football. I'm surprised he's still with us. I'm still surprised he's um, he's attempting to be a professional footballer still. Uh, that that's his career choice right now. Uh, and so if he if we sign him up for another season, you know, the guy keeps surprising me. So uh, I, I wouldn't be shocked, but I wouldn't be. Um, I wouldn't be shocked the other way if we didn't offer him a contract. Does that make sense? I, I, I you know, it, it, it's all down to the club and Steve Bruce essentially. But uh, I, I mean, yeah. Rich, what, what, what do you think? My gut, my gut feeling is that 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 he will get, a, and it might only be a year, I think. But I think I think that there's one that'll. He's starting to. He's proven his fitness. He's coming back. Um, will he? Will he? Can it? Will he? prove that he's any good anymore we don't know but I think I think it, I don't know is it fair to give him a year um at the end of this or, or do we just cut his losses and I mean the last time he came back from injury he, he was we could tell how much we'd missed him he was fantastic uh are we going to get that, that same hit in the next seven games we're, we're, we're about to see that I think is Gary Hooper going to come into negotiations about a contract at the age of 31 32 Knowing that this is probably, um, if not his last contract, then very close to his last contract negotiation that he's going to have, is he going to make a play to stay at Sheffield Wednesday, which would necessarily mean reducing his wages at the club? At the moment, you know, we don't. It's, we think it's around the thirty thousand pound a week mark that he's getting paid. It would be madness for Sheffield Wednesday to offer him even a one-year contract on those wages. So do we get to the point where it's almost in Gary Hooper's gift to come with a realistic offer to say, OK, I want to prove myself for one more year. I think I've got it in me. The club to say, yes, we like what you can offer, but not at the price that we, you know, we paid in 2015 when we first took you on loan. So I think there's an awful lot of discussion to be had. And I don't think it's entirely down to whether Gary Hooper wants to stay at Wednesday, or whether Wednesday would like to have Gary Hooper on the pitch. There's going to be a massive discussion around what we can afford to pay Gary Hooper 
and what Gary Hooper in an open market is actually worth versus the next worst option. Yeah, he's, he's not going to get this, he's not going to get the same deal, is he? You you wouldn't think but so, no, would you? Because he, he, he is he he's definitely about, a high earner. Yeah, but all through his career, I mean, I don't I don't know. I'm I'm not a footballer on my way down. I'm a podcaster on my way up, drinking craft beer. But <laughs> I I wonder whether Gary Hooper or any other footballer in that position is going to think: Is it better for me to play another year, risk further injury, go through all of the rigmarole? and the stress and the strain on my body of carrying on and know that I'm going to be every day of my life earning, let's say for the sake of argument, half of what I used to earn for doing the exact same thing. At what point then do you just go, you know what? It's not worth it. I've made a handsome amount of money. I've got the lifestyle that I want. My I'm, my future is secure. I'm going to walk away with my, my head held high. And I think that's going to be more of a decision than than even whether Wednesday's financial constraints give us the opportunity to offer him, um, you know, even a, a fifteen grand a week contract. Let's say. Okay, um, two really key moments in the game, um, Fudge. I'm going to come to you to get your take on these. So, uh, first of all, at first half, disallowed goal from George Boyd. Um, at the time, really hard to, to tell. In the immediate aftermath, all the talk was that it was probably the right decision. And then quite a lot of stills and screenshots doing the rounds on social media since that just make you think, hmm, don't know. What was your take? I thought it was pretty stonewall. I thought, I thought it was, um, it was, <laughs> you know, it should have been disallowed. I, I don't, I think it's very easy to manipulate screen grabs and all that sort of thing to, to, to suit your own agenda. But I, I was a, you know, I didn't really realise there was that much of a discussion. I'm not, I'm not seen much of it. I mean, you probably, uh, you probably follow a different timeline to me. I probably follow the uh, the bloody rubbish chips and gravy timeline, whereas yours is obviously, you know, 1982 concepts, draft retro kits, and craft beer. But you know, I, 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 I didn't really see much of a discussion on it. I thought it was, it was the correct call. Um, unpopular opinion. My apologies. Uh, other key incident then, save by Westwood in the second half. I mean, that's the kind of save that 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 earns you a point, doesn't it? And it's not a bad point away at, at Stoke, but they're the moments that really uh, that, that get you those results. I think you've nailed that right on the head there. I think uh, looking back on uh, just even if you just look at the highlights as as a whole, I think that that save um, there was. Uh, there was a couple of guilt test chances they had in the second half as well, where, you know, as daft as it sounds, I think that that is a, a point gained. I know it's, it's severely dented our, uh, our playoff uh, glimmer of hope that we had, but, um, but I, I genuinely believe that that is a point gained. And I think that that save specifically could have been the difference between, yeah, you know, going home with one point and going home with absolutely none. Um, I, I, when the cold light of day gets shone on these games two or three days later when we record this podcast, I think that um, I think that surely we must all be in agreement that we've we've not been lucky to come away with a point, but I, I think it was a, a just result and it was a point gained rather than, you know, we feel a little bit aggrieved to have not taken all three. Was Stoke better than we expected them to be? I, I agree. I, I think you're dead right. I think mm -hmm. that there is there was a, an element of, because of the form we're in and because of the last time we've actually dropped, you know, we've come, we haven't come away with, with any points from a game in, in 12 now. And I think we've, we got carried away with ourselves. We're a sentimental bunch of Sheffield Wednesday fans, aren't we? So we've gone in there thinking, yeah, we'll go in business as usual, we'll probably get a two, one nil, two nil win. And then we'll see you later. And then we'll move on. And then we'll see you at Wembley and May lads. And, um, I think we've, we've hit our ass on the floor with a bit of a bump. After this game, and uh, and I think we've started. We should have been doing this anyway, but now we're going to be giving teams a bit more credit than what they deserve, like we should have done with Stoke on Saturday. Uh, we made it to about thirty minutes into uh, into this show before someone mentioned the uh, the P O words. Um, so, Rich, um, the, the the kind of the playoff talk kind of crept up. Um, somewhat unexpected considering the way the season looked like it, it was going to be going. Um, 
Bristol City winning against Middlesbrough the other night. What's your kind of take on the situation at the moment? Is is playoffs still a thing in your mind, or do you think it's time that we kind of put it to bed? I'm not sure it ever was really. I just thought we, we we've been close. Uh, we, you know, at one point on a weekend, if we'd have won, I think we'd have we'd have gone into seventh. Um, I, I kind of, I just. Uh, I don't see it happening at all, I'll be honest. I, I've, I've said, and I think that's right from the beginning of the season, I'd take 10th this year because it was a bit of a transition season for lots of reasons. Um, I, 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 obviously, Bristol City play well and they're in the, in the top six now. Uh, I'm just trying to look at actually exactly how many points we're off right now. We're, we're 11th and four points off it. So it's not, you know, and we're playing teams above us in the next couple of games, Villa and Forest. So it's not, it's not out of realms of, Impossibility. I think it'd be just an absolute, for me, it'd just be an absolute bonus if we got there. If not, it's nice to see we've got a good manager. We're playing well. And that gives us a lot of hope, uh, for, for next season. Uh, and that's the big the kind of bonus for me is we've got a guy that seems to be really getting us ticking with an average kind of bunch of players as some of them are playing right now or have been playing. Um, so yeah, I, I'm kind of I'm I'm more hopeful for next season than 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 this. Even with four points as the gap, and look, we've got far more excited about a playoff push with far more than four points separating us from the top six. You know, you think back to um, that season. Uh, was it uh, was it under Laws or, St- or Sturrock? I can't even remember. I think it was Laws when we just kind of missed out um, in that game against Birmingham, etc. You know, we were in and about it for an awful lot when we were a much worse team. I think even given the four points, you look at the teams that are up there and the way the fixtures shake out, and it would be one of the all-time biggest surprises. You know, thinking about, what was it, Palace, that were in the bottom three at Christmas and ended up going up through the playoffs. Um, at your 538.com, uh, without, we're not getting all hours about stat here because we don't, we don't bite the hand that feeds us. Um, they're saying we now are at a 4% chance of making the playoffs. Before the Stoke game, it was a 7% chance. So it was never a large chance, but it has just effectively halved. So, yeah, it's only four points. And I think everyone said this um, when commentating on, on the situation with Wednesday, is that if we do it, no one can say we haven't deserved it because in order to do it, we will have had to have knocked off most of our rivals in and about it, plus arguably the two best teams in this division away from home. So, um, yeah, it's it's a massive ask, and that's why the stats don't back it up. Um, I think the number of points is almost a complete smokescreen for us. It we, yeah. When the, uh, Sam Winnell was interviewed, wasn't he, by uh, Dom on another excellent podcast that you should all listen to, um, and he talked an awful lot <laughs> about um, thinking that, that kind of six out of eight victories was going to be, you know, the the, the key, uh, you know, getting it around there was enough. Um, we're now at a point where we pretty much have to win out. Certainly, if we're going to get defeated, um, we have to win every single game to, to realistically expect to be in there. So let's see what happens. You know, I think the squeak, if anything, is getting fainter and fainter. but. Every week that we're still in it keeps us all interested. So why not embrace it and just see where it goes? Because stranger things can and do happen. That's um, that gap. Uh, there was a large gap, wasn't there? I think it was when when we first started looking at this. It was something like sixth to about fourteenth um, that could have snuck into the playoffs. Then Bristol City dropped a few, and then I think now it's more fifth till. Us or Hull, which is which is twelfth, which is still you know seven teams all 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 got their eye on it, and like you say, we're playing we're playing all of those teams. Do you know what I mean? We're, we're playing them all. Take your pick. We're playing them. Um, I think it's I, I I'm with you, Eddie. I think it, it's just a squeak. But given the way our form's gone the last twelve games, I'd be ridiculous to write us off, you know. And um, and let's not forget as well, you've got Bristol City who've managed to beat uh, Middlesbrough, and uh, who did they beat? Uh, Sheffield United as well. <laughs> that that wasn't even a gag. I actually forgot who they just beaten. So that you know that's two that's six big points of of their own that they've got. So so they've got their playoff berth. 
And uh, I don't think they want to let go of it either. A, a destiny is in, in our own, our own hands a little bit, isn't it? It's just, it's, you know, if we, we if we do well in these next few games, then you never know. But um, it's just, just nice to just, just be watching a football and enjoying it again. That's, that's, that's my overriding thing at the moment. Absolutely. Yeah, great point, that. Great point. And um, from, from where we have been at points this season to where we are now, um, it almost doesn't really matter. It would be such a bonus, wouldn't it, to make it into the top six? But I think, um, you know, we, we all have our positive hats back on and, um, that is something to be, um, to be celebrated. So we'll put the, uh, the Stoke game to bed. I think we all agree that all in all, probably a, a decent point that one, um, on the road. Uh, this is the Wednesday week with the Riverside Cafe. Um, so we talked about, the um, surprise in seeing Gary Hooper back in a Wednesday shirt, specifically on Saturday, but I think for some of us, probably a surprise to have seen it at all. Um, another guy who we have had to fairly continually write off in terms of his chances of um, of making an appearance in a Wednesday shirt again is Kieran Lee. But um, Fudge, it, it's, it's no longer something that's... Um, completely out the realm of possibility. I'm trying not to get carried away because we've we've been here before. I think, was it, when was it? Was it back in November or something or September? It could even be September, where Kieran Lee played a, uh, a de- developmental squad game, didn't he? And uh, I think he went off after something like 18 minutes and I thought, oh, no, it's gone again. Because for me, um, Kieran Lee is the unsung hero of anything we've achieved in the in the year that we were outstanding, uh, the the tw- he is he, for me he is the poster boy of the 2016 season. Um, so to to get to get uh, I can't remember uh, there is not a better term and my apologies in advance to get cocktees like we did um, when he played that 18 minute cameo and then to go off again and go missing for another three months was was. Heartbreaking for me, and no doubt heartbreaking for him. Don't don't get me wrong. Now, if if he could pull off a Gary Hooper esque, you know, come back straight into the first eleven, get himself a new contract, and and all the rest of it, then I will literally have no problem with it. But he's got to prove that um, that his fitness has to be up there because I, I for me, I think he's worth bending over backwards for. I I absolutely love him. The the ground he covers, the way he moves across the pitch. Is, is something to behold. I would rather show a young child interested in football a video of Kieran Lee moving around a pitch than Lionel Messi. Because, and I know, I know that sounds insane, but if you watch Messi, he stands there, he, he's got his, what is it, the Czech Easter role, isn't it, that he plays or whatever you pronounce it, and he floats around and does fairly little, and then the ball comes and bang, he's beat six players, chipped it onto the penalty spot and edited it in himself. Do you know what I mean? This is... This is a guy that's so far, far and above in terms of abil- in, uh, so far and above in terms of his ability. He doesn't need to do the regular midfield things. Whereas Kieran Lee absolutely does everything a midfielder should in in the modern game. The way he moves, the way he passes, the way he's got his head up, the way he drops deep, the way he t- challenges when he has to is is sublime. And I am hoping and praying that he has some. Absolute miraculous comeback where he's no longer made of glass and comes back and absolutely sends a soaring into the Premier League inside the next year. Is anybody else thinking I'm being a bit yes. romantic? I, I, yeah, I think yes. you are. I'd, I'd, I'd love to believe it, Phil. I really would. Because I, I think I said it last week or the week before, he'd make such a difference was coming back now. Such a difference. A, a fully fit Kieran Lee. But I think Bruce has said this week, hasn't he, that, that he, this season is going to be too soon for him. Uh, and with his contract up, is he going to wear that shirt again? I really hope he does, but who knows? That's that is the question, and isn't just it? Just for the um, sake of, of any any parents who are listening and are thinking of showing their children a video of Kieran Lee, just be very <laughs> careful yeah. which video you download. The Check it first. <laughs> Have a look. Make sure it's what you expect because it could it could go horribly wrong. Yeah, put Kieran Lee football in maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um Eddie you were you were you were telling us a couple of minutes ago that uh the uh, the stats tell you there's a 4% chance of 
Wednesday making the playoffs. Um, do you rate the chances of Kieran Lee getting a new contract higher or lower than 4%? <laughs> oh, brilliant. Great Play games, great games. Play your card right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're getting out for a pair. Um, I did an eight. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, look, Kieran Lee is an eight, isn't he, at his best. Uh, we talked about Gary Hooper having eight games to prove himself. Um, my gut feel is that eight games isn't long enough. Um, again, it will come down to whether Kieran Lee, uh, commercially, whether he makes sense to Sheffield Wednesday or whether Sheffield Wednesday uh, and whether Sheffield Wednesday makes sense to him. I, I can't imagine that there will be suitors out there. I can't imagine that anyone's going to increase the financial package that he's got because he's made of biscuits. But in the same way that we have given contracts, short-term contracts to players who, let's be honest, may have value in the dressing room and on the training ground way more than their value on the pitch. Um, I think it would be a real shame if we let Kieran Lee go without at least understanding and exploring exactly what, you know, how the, how how he can stay at Sheffield Wednesday if we can structure a way for him to do it he's too good a player to just give up on surely. Uh, oh, when you said biscuits, Eddie, without wanting to do a Peter K routine here, are we talking pink wafer rather than a digestive? No, I, exactly. You couldn't right now. You couldn't dunk him, could you? You could not <laughs> dunk him <laughs> like a hobnob <laughs> in a cup of tea. Uh. So, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Who knows? Who knows what biscuit? It's at the moment. It's probably um, the, the really shitty wafers that you get at a cheap <laughs> ice cream store. Uh. Um, Eddie, that was uh, lovely, but you did go a little bit Theresa May there. You didn't ask the bollocks. You didn't answer the bollocks in question. Um, so higher or lower than four percent? What, what, what are you going? <laughs> yeah, no, it's de right. Definitely higher than four percent. I think there's probably a, a ten to fifteen percent chance that we see Kieran Lee. Uh, get another contract to Sheffield Wednesday and be here next season. Okay, that's interesting. Um, Eddie, I'm going to stay with you because I want to talk a little bit about Fernando Forestieri. Now, um, he's obviously had um, a, a fairly um, a fairly explosive week in, 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 in many senses. So he was back in the team on Saturday and that came hot on the heels of the uh, the ending of his um, court case. It's probably not something that we want to go into kind of too much um, detail about. Um, but one thing it does mean is that it's a bit of a kind of a clean bill of health now for, for, for Fernando and a chance for him to just get on with doing the talking on the pitch. Yeah, and it's. I think it came down to a bit of a... The, the judge in the case recognised that at its heart, it was a bit of a he said, she said situation. So um, I think his judgment suggested that he couldn't be certain um, to a criminal extent that Fernando Forestieri used, you know, the language that he was accused of using. So um, given the way that our justice procedure works, he, he had to be found innocent on that basis. And that's absolutely fine. He was cleared of it. I think, I know um, Dom broke the story uh, in the last 24 hours that um, the Football Association is going to continue to investigate this. It won't be a criminal matter, but it may well be a disciplinary matter, and we'll see what comes out of that. Um, but as it stands, I think the right decision has been made. Um, if there is no, if there's no real smoking gun there on either side, then I think it's important that um, everyone's views were heard. I think it's it's highlighted an important message, which is there is no place for racism in the game, and you know it's, it's very high profile at the moment with um, the recent occurrences uh, with Raheem Sterling, and of course with um, uh, the Italian player uh, overnight last night in the Juventus game. So yeah, I think it's probably it's probably done everybody a favour. Um, in the final analysis because it, it's thrown back into sharp focus that um, everybody connected with the game wants any aspect of racism out of the game. So um, apart from racists. So, um, you know, so great. It's one one nil against racists today. So, uh, so brilliant. So let's hope that Forestieri can put it behind him. I think Steve Bruce suggested, didn't he, that, uh, that it is a weight off his shoulders. He's going to be able to go back to, to playing with a smile on his face. 
Uh, I, you know, and we'll see how it goes. I think for the the first instance, I think his um, is getting his fitness and his match sharpness back is going to have far more impact than uh, how his you know his mindset is. But it's it's good news for Fernando. It's good news for the club, and probably in the final analysis, it's good news for football. Uh, that again, it's been highlighted that there's no place for it, and and people who do cross that line will be dealt with harshly. Here, here. Well said. Well said, that man. Uh, right, Dicky. Um, we're gonna we're gonna talk yeah. now about contracts. Um, yeah. So, well, we'll we'll chat about them in a moment. First of all. Let's play a game. So, um, Eddie gave Kieran Lee a 15% chance of getting a contract. So, I'm going to give you a name. I want you to tell me whether you think there's a higher or lower chance of said player getting a new contract. And we're going to go through... I, I lower than that 15% we're talking. Yeah, so, uh, right. George Boyd, higher or lower chance than Kieran Lee? Lower. Or is that just lower. me? Yeah, no, I that might be a little... <laughs> it's not just so me then. I'm all right with that. For George Boyd. Right. <laughs> yeah. So we're we're currently on so your current card is George Boyd. You've gone mm. lower. So you've basically got you've got probably a two now on um on play yeah, cards, yeah, right? Yeah. So higher yeah. or lower chance for Gary Hooper. Higher. Uh, and I, I, I'd higher. go I got like I think that's a fifty fifth no, maybe even a sixty forty one on that. In favour okay. of. So that's probably like what, maybe a an eight or a nine card there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. Um, so you're on Gary Hooper. Higher or lower chance of a new contract for Liam Palmer? Uh, oh, higher. Yeah, higher. Almost feels like a given, doesn't it? The way he's been playing. Yeah, recently. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So yeah, really, um, you, you, you've probably got you've got an, an um, no offense to Liam you've got you've got a queen there in uh, in Liam Palmer. So <laughs> are you going higher or lower for Kieran Westwood? I go lower. Westwood. The big dog Westwood is back in the contract negotiations. His contract game is strong. <laughs> yeah, no, I, <laughs> no, you know what? I, <laughs> I've not done a Westwood impression for quite some time. So, <laughs> yeah, um, good reason. Yeah, good reason for that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't. I don't see that. I can you can you honestly see unless unless we are going to make a very splashy signing of another keeper? Are we? Really, even you know Westwood salary, yes, okay, but even given all of that, the form that he's shown again this season, now he's back in the team. Is there any chance that we are going to go? You know what? We're rolling with Dawson and Wildsmith going forward, but, 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 unless we are in serious financial jeopardy, surely, surely Westwood's contract is the one that we would want to get, even if it means losing Hooper, losing Lee, losing Boyd. But could Westwood be the problem in that? Could he be the You're absolutely right? All day long, he should be. We should be just slapping the contract in front of him, getting him signed on for next season. But may he be the problem with that? That he doesn't want to stay for another year. I, I've not heard anything well, not, said by him. There's, yeah, it's, there's, there's also <laughs> the issue, isn't there? That um, at the the last fans forum that the chairman was was fairly insistent in saying, yeah, Kieran Westwood's contract is, is just going to run down and he's going to leave in the in the summer. You know, he kind of he was quite explicit in in saying it. And that was only just before Christmas. That's not that that long ago. Yeah. Fair enough, he has come back he in the team. He wasn't in the team then though, was he? He did say he wasn't going to sack Lukai at that point as well. Yeah. Fair point. Fair point. He also said he was going to tell the club immediately. So, uh, you know, we can uh, probably dismiss a, a, a lot of that. Um, so a lot of other names in there. Um, we've, we've talked previously about Kieran Lee. We've talked about Hooper. We've talked about Westwood there. We've probably talked about Palmer. Um, Dan Fudge, do you give any credence to any thought of George Boyd? And I have to say his name in a really negative way. George Boyd, um, oh. staying a Sheffield Wednesday player beyond the next seven games. I didn't think we'd ever see him in a Wednesday shirt again. Um, and somehow there he is starting the flipping match on Saturday. So um, what what do you think? It seems like, 
when, when we signed George Boyd, I was kind of excited. I was a little bit like, I remember when Nottingham Forest nearly signed him. I was like, God, that'd be a great sign at this level. That'd be really good. And then what turned up was this uh, limp, one-eyed, you know, mixomatosis rabbit. Like, you know what I mean? Um, I, I mean, don't get me wrong. He's a pretty man. And, and you know me. Um, you know, he, he, he's not up there with Sam Hutchinson, but he's only about one. He's only one level lower. But I, I, I'd, I'd be very surprised if, um, if we do offer him a contract because he's at that stage of his career now where it's it's starting to wind down a little bit. I think there will be probably a high end League One club or a lower end Championship club that will probably come and take him off our hands, and I think he'll probably move back up to the northwest somewhere. Yeah, fair calls. All right. Um, let's talk a bit about um, a guy that we have. Um, I think we've we've instilled every compliment that we probably can do onto him. Um, but the the stats are going to do the talking a little bit here. So Stephen Fletcher um, has won Player of the Month for March, which by my reckoning is three months in a row. Also means that he's the only player that's won Player of the Month during the entirety of 2019 so far for um, Sheffield Wednesday, um, which, I mean, uh, we, are, we, are, we, uh, are we at risk of just becoming a bit of a one-man team here, Rich? Um, is, that, is that player of the month or man of the month? Have we changed the name of it now? Yeah, well, it's, it is man of the month. So, uh, <laughs> I kind of lost that one, didn't I? <laughs> I, think, I, just, I think he's been the standout player, hasn't he? And fair play to him, you know. We've not really had a... I'm sure he's not a three in a row in in like in three seasons in a row recent uh, you know in recent times with us but uh, but uh, no I think he's he's been he's been fantastic and someone got him to get a goal the overhead kick was it against Swansea he scored that against uh, you know it's just he's been he's well deserved it can't knock him at all very true well done to uh, to Stephen Fletcher uh, right let's look ahead to Saturday um, Eddie. Um, now, you, you kind of referenced earlier uh, another podcast out there. I'll have to check that one out, actually. It sounds quite good. Um, so if you if you listen to Steve Bruce talk, uh, you will be aware of the fact that he does have a tendency sometimes to mention Aston Villa. Now, I'm not necessarily saying <laughs> that he's got hard feelings about the fact that he got fired from there. Uh, but I've got this idea in my head that he might be quite fired up for this game on Saturday. I'm reasonably certain that if there's anything that can take Steve Bruce back to uh, his his word processor to write a series of excellent crime fiction novels set in the world of football, <laughs> it will have been his experience at Villa. Um, you can tell how passionate he is about this. So um, yeah, it's it, it's you know it's no longer Hednersford Town and, and Muncaster United. Um, this is real, and it is Sheffield Wednesday against the team that jilted him. I'm kind of surprised that he's so aggy about it because obviously he's, he, he, uh, you know, as much as he was uh, almost kind of a one-team footballer, he made his name at Manchester United and did everything in his career that was great at Manchester United. Um, he's become almost like a journeyman manager, hasn't he? You know, with the, the number of teams that he's managed and the, the number of stories he's told. So it does seem strange because most other managers that have that kind of persuasion would probably just put it down to experience and move on to the next one. Um, but obviously it's still fresh. Obviously it's still raw. He uh, has obviously inside knowledge of what is going on in that squad and the, the individual temperaments of those players. So I don't want to overplay it because we've seen it many, 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 many times that, the, the idea that a former player comes back and always haunts his old club or, you know, a, a, a manager who has been jilted comes back and gets revenge. It doesn't always happen, but it obviously means a lot to Brucey and Steve Bruce, his style of management is very much about taking his players with him emotionally. So, you know, in the same way that Gary Megson would, he's not going to lack, leave anything there um, in the dressing room. He's going to make sure they know why they they have to go out there and, and win it. And it, it might be more than just the same team talk that he gave against Stoke. And it might be more than let's just go out there and win because that maintains our promotion push. It's going to be really fascinating to see. Um, and I think it's possibly the last chance this season um, for the Wednesday team and the organisation to uh, 
get the fans absolutely on board and buzzing about this because I think three points at Hillsborough against Villa, um, especially if other results kind of go our way and we are still within touching distance come 5 p.m., um, that squeak will start getting louder again. So it's imperative that we do it. But uh, I fully expect to hear the cop, you know, singing out loud um, about you know, not knowing how we're going to get to the Premier League, but we are on our way. So let's see what we can do. It won't be for want of trying, will it? Yeah, fair point. Um, Fudge, as Eddie kind of mentions there about the fact that, I mean, we've got, if we, if we are saying that the aim for this season is still to finish in the top six, you know, we've got a series of pretty big cup finals coming up because um, the fixtures do not get any easier. Probably the only fixture we've got left to play this season that you would look at and go, well, we should win that. We'll probably be QPR on the last day of the season, by which point it's probably all done and dusted. Or um, actually, if it's a game that we do need to win to secure a playoff place, it's probably not a bad game to uh, to finish on. Um, but this, I mean, this should be an absolute cracker of a game on Saturday, shouldn't it? Uh, so, yeah, I think it, I think it's a massive one. And we've had some great days. In fact, you and I, James, were at the last one where uh, Re- uh, the one before where Reach scored inside 18 seconds with John Terry on his arse and and all the rest of it. I like Villa Park. It's a great away day. And um, and I think I think you're dead right, Eddie. I think there's going to be points where we're going to be singing about our wonderful Steve Bruce's all the way through that game. And um, I'm excited about it because I, I, I think you're right. Yes, we have something like seven cup finals left now. Uh, if we're going to... But you, you don't get to be the best without beating the best. And uh, away at Villa is one of the biggest games of the season. And, um, and I want to kind of absolutely compound their misery, especially after the tweet they did about them coming to uh, Sheffield and coming away with six points because they beat both of the clubs in the, in the town. I think that was the only time on Twitter yeah. I've ever seen Sheffield Wednesday and United fans united in their vitriol, you know what I mean, towards that god-awful marketing <laughs> department they've got at Aston Villa. So, um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's a massive game and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm up for it. I'm up for it. Let's have a tear up. Bang! All right, Rich. Yeah, it's 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 going to be a. Uh, uh, I'm going to use the N word. It's going to be a massive week for us, isn't it? Really, it's um, Villa Forest Leeds in the next uh, the next ne- the next week. So that's going to really define what's going to happen. I think um, starting with, with Saturday against Villa, um, four points behind them, behind them now. Three points. If we, uh, sorry, a point behind them if we if we. Uh, if we do the business, but who knows? I just, you just, you'd hope that we're up for this. And these are the kind of games, if we're gonna, if we, if we deserve to be in the playoffs, these are the kind of, kind of games we've got to go out and uh, put a performance on and get the result. It's exciting though, isn't it? Isn't it exciting this? Absolutely. I think it's yeah. great. I, I mean, love like the we fact that we've earlier. actually, yeah. seven games to go. We've actually got something to play for here. We, you know, it's a game that, as you yeah. say, if we win it, we go, we go a point behind Villa, who were one of the favourites for the playoffs. I quite like talking positively. I used to be one of the negative ones, but, but I thought, oh, positive now. I quite like it. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's a, every week is a gift if we are still in it. And you know what? A good performance against Villa, however the three points comes, even if it's, it's a 1 0 or a 2 1, however those three points come, if we get those three points, you know that you know the juggernaut is back on. Forrest are going to just take a little step and go, hang on a minute. You know, these boys mean business. We don't know what's going to happen this week. And if we can take six points into, you know, that Leeds game, you know, that is going to be absolutely huge. It's been a, a little while since we've we've gone in there and done it and, and, and done them, but we have certainly been competitive in every game. And I know they're fighting, um, but, but they've got to go to Middlesbrough and get something. And I'll tell you what, I will love it. I will love it when we beat them. So, uh, yeah, let's see. Let's see. But it's exciting, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so you're listening to the Wednesday Week brought to you with the Riverside Cafe. That's going to pretty much wrap us up for this week. Um, so, um, Dan Fudge, if people want to keep up with your exploits and photos of you drinking a can of, I don't know, cock sniffer or whatever uh, the uh, the beer you've got in your fridge is called. Yeah. Uh, where can we do uh, It's called Monkey Spank. Uh, yeah, you can see me on Twitter. It's at Dan Fudge. Um, 
you know, get get involved. I like I like a healthy debate, me. But I, I'm done with Brexit. You, can, you know, leave, leave a pin in that because uh, I, I'm I'm just sick to the back teeth of it. And uh, I think it's been pushed back to um, the 12th of April. And if you're interested, on the 12th of April is when I fly to Luxembourg to do three games of football in three days. So uh, can't wait to see what international driving permit I need to use for that one. So. Uh, I'll be, uh, I'll, I'll be live blogging the event, so uh, we'll see if Theresa May has caused me a crap or a decent holiday. We'll find out from there. Live blogging the event. It's like having Daryl Lackman back. Brilliant. Uh, right, Rich, <laughs> um, where can we find you on social media? And will you accept the challenge of posting a photo of you with one of Marco Matthias's tarts in the next seven days? I absolutely can do that. I uh, yeah, watch out on Dicky Owl uh, at Dicky Owl on Twitter, but I, I will absolutely post a picture of me uh, nibbling on one of his tarts. <laughs> I just love the phrase "mark so many ways we could... It's just brilliant, isn't yeah, it? We could go in so many directions with that, couldn't we? <laughs> uh, Eddie, same question to you. Where, whereabouts are you on social media and? Um, how many pictures of you in a retro shirt can uh, can you post in the next twenty four hours? Oh, you know what? I might have to go through the collection and do it all just to uh, to wind up a certain constituency of Wednesday fan. Um, and I'll be doing it while drinking a, a, a bottle of Finn Lux Pale Ale, which has been uh, which has been brewed locally with a retro flair. Um, <laughs> yeah. See- Seriously, I, I hate, I will never be one of these people who like try and break up a fight. Well, come on, we're all Wednesday, aren't we? We're all Wednesday, aren't we? Um, you know what? Just like every club, we have, um, many, many great fans and a few absolute full weight pricks. And they've been in evidence in the last week, which is, um, sad to see, but we'll get past it because they, uh, they don't actually matter in the scheme of things. We'll keep on doing what we're doing. Um, we love Wednesday. We know they love Wednesday, even if, they're a little bit twisted and sad. Um, and a big shout out to uh, Victoria, Victoria1867 on Twitter, um, because she's had a, a bit of a tough time of it over the last seven days, um, mainly because of aforementioned absolute fucking bell end pricks. Um, so, yeah, at me, by all means, at Sausage Arms on Twitter. Uh, we can talk about, till the cows come home, about qualifications for being a Sheffield Wednesday fan. Um, but... I'm going to get my blue and white striped dick on the table, and I'm pretty sure that I'm just as much a Wednesday fan as anybody. So, uh, yeah, a little bit of a rant, but let's keep it positive. Uh, I'm really looking forward to Villa, and uh, hopefully I'll see everybody in the Riverside Cafe uh, before the game, and we'll get that three points, and we'll carry on marching towards the inevitable, which is Sheffield Wednesday becoming a fixture on Saturday night BBC television match of the day once again. Well said, that man. Uh, right, you can get me on social media at James Marriott. Um, of course, you can track down the uh, the podcast using all the usual uh, usual means. And um, well, have a great weekend, and we will see you next week. Keep up to date with the Wednesday Week on Twitter at TWWcast or on our website, thewednesdayweek.co.uk.